1987. Ronald Reagan challenged Mikhail Gorbachev to tear down the Berlin Wall. Films like Full Metal Jacket, Raising Arizona, Evil Dead 2, and Robocop were crushed at the box office by three men and a fucking baby. The Beatles catalog was released on compact disc, Michael Jackson began his artistic and commercial decline with the release of Bad, and Joe Biden had the summer of a lifetime. But 1987 also saw some of the most influential video game releases of the 8-bit era, many of which would go on to become massively successful franchises. Though it never achieved the stature or longevity of any of those franchises, Double Dragon became a worldwide success after its arcade release that year, leading to a 1988 NES port and being further immortalized in the 1989 film The Wizard. 50,000? You got 50,000 on Double Dragon? It was a kinder, gentler time, when gamers were eager to team up against hordes of computer-controlled enemies, before games like Street Fighter II and Mortal Kombat made us turn on one another. But the Double Dragon franchise sputtered out of control in the mid-90s, producing the worst game of the series and the lowest-rated video game film adaptation of all time, according to Rotten Tomatoes. Think about that. The worst video game adaptation. That's like saying the stinkiest shit, or the most anti-Semitic Nazi. If you've managed to fall short of expectations when the bar is set that low, something is seriously wrong. But the series has lived on in the hearts and minds of gamers who grew up playing the 8-bit classics. Lucky for us, the series is back in all of its go-right-and-punch-everything glory with the release of Double Dragon Neon, a reboot of the franchise now available for download on the PlayStation Network Store and the Xbox Live Arcade. Developed by WayForward Technologies, who have previously worked on updates of 8-bit gems such as Contra and A Boy in His Blob, the game is essentially a remake of the first Double Dragon. For about five minutes, anyways. The game is well aware of who its target audience is. People who used to play the 8-bit Double Dragon games and who remember the 1980s as a giant clusterfuck of neon coloring, bad puns, and white guys doing martial arts. And the game does a remarkable job of catering to that demographic, looking back at the 80s through the lens of nostalgia much in the same way Vice City did years back. And it's a blast, even if our eyes go deaf from looking at the visuals. Most of the environments are given liberal helpings of the titular color scheme, and Billy and Jimmy have been reimagined as a sort of kung fu capable Bill and Ted, speaking in a borderline stoner dialect and spouting idiotic puns. Oh man! More like science unfair! Gameplay remains mostly true to its original form, with a few slight tweaks and additions, most notable being the mixtape system. One side represents your stance, which is a passive stat increase, such as higher defense or increased attack power, and the other side represents your sosetsitsu, special attacks such as the classic spin kick that consume magic points. In practice, this function is not entirely unlike the paradigm system from Final Fantasy games, especially at higher difficulties, where you'll find yourself switching to the power gambit stance for one attack, and then immediately going back to the training wheel stance to raise your defense. You can upgrade your mixtapes by collecting mithril from boss fights and collecting tapes, which can be purchased from shops in-game or collected as random drops from regular enemies. You also have the ability to roll and dodge attacks, something that was not available in the early versions of the game, but the controls for doing so were a bit spotty at times, and the inability to change direction when rolling or jumping will result in a few unwanted deaths here and there. Also, the classic Double Dragon hockey punch is missing, which, while trivial, I found to be fairly disappointing. The game is mapped out Castlevania style, where you can see an avatar of your 8-bit counterpart hovering over the level you're on. Also, in levels that don't end with a boss fight, a giant orb drops down from the top of the screen that needs to be collected to end the level, which is also borrowed from its 1987 brethren. Plenty of fun can be had playing single player, but the true fun of the game is had in co-op mode. I mean, come on, they didn't call the game Double Dragon to encourage you to dick around by yourself. You can turn on friendly fire to ramp up the challenge or go for certain trophies and achievements, or you can leave it off so you and your co-op partner can refrain from completely resenting one another. Unfortunately, there's no option for online multiplayer, so you won't be able to relive your Double Dragon glory days with old elementary school chums who now live out of state, which is a colossal disappointment. I could go play Streets of Rage 2 online right now if I wanted to, but I can't do the same with Double Dragon Neon. The game has three difficulties. Normal, Dragon, and Double Dragon. Normal being an accessible level of play that most people should be able to get through, and Double Dragon being a challenge that rivals, well, Double Dragon. 
The soundtrack is decent, nicely accenting the 1980s camp aesthetic, but some of the songs include lyrics, which gives them a markedly shorter shelf life. After spending a few hours grinding for Mithril on a second level, I had to turn off the music and turn to my iPod for an alternate soundtrack, which is why I think all serious gamers should own a mixer to afford themselves this luxury. Unfortunately, there's no option to turn off the dialogue as well, and given the relatively few number of things Billy, Jimmy, and their opposition can say, you'll get pretty sick of all the bad puns quickly. In addition to the repetitious nature of incidental dialogue, there's also Skullmageddon, the game's antagonist, who has been voiced by a bad Wallace Shawn impersonator. I'm your worst nightmare! Skullmageddon! Inconceivable. Overall, the game is fantastic, and stands as arguably the best co-op brawler ever made, despite its lack of online co-op. The game is relatively short, but is priced accordingly, and it's free for PlayStation Plus, so subscribers have no earthly reason not to play this game. While the garish visuals can be a bit much at times, the color palette does tone down a bit later on as the game returns to more familiar territory. Classic beat-em-up gameplay has never been better, with three levels of difficulty to accommodate most skill levels, and there's nothing quite as satisfying as spin-kicking someone's scrotum into the back of their skull. Hopefully this won't be the last time WayForward visits this franchise, and hopefully the next time they'll find the comfortable middle ground between the game's decadent nostalgia and the gritty realism being shat out by pretty much everyone these days.